EAA's webinars are made possible through the generous support of Aircraft Spruce and Specialty, serving home builders and EAA members since 1965. Tonight's presentation is titled GA and Big Data. It's part two in a two-part series. Last month, on February 1st, uh, Mike Bush was back here and he gave us part one. This is a continuation of that, uh, that webinar, part two. Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aircraft Maintenance Management. He's author for numerous aviation publications, holds a CFI certificate, an A&P mechanic certificate with inspection authorization. In 2008, he was the Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year, so honored by the FAA and the community, and a member of EAA. Mike, I'm going to turn control of the presentation over to you. As Tim mentioned, this is a, uh, a part two of a, of a two-part webinar uh, that I started um, last month on uh, big data. And uh, for those of you who uh, missed that uh, the uh, the February webinar is available online in the in the EAA webinar archive. Um, but during uh, last month's webinar, I, I talked about the fact that uh, the savvy analysis division of my company has been over the last four years or so um, building a, a, a pretty impressive size database of uh, real-life data from uh, general aviation aircraft flights. Uh, we have uh, about a million two hundred flights in the database right now, growing every day, uh, from about nine thousand different piston GA airplanes of, of uh, every sort, from from uh, from uh, RVs to uh, Cessna 421s and. Um, everything in between. Um, and this is data that uh, is uh, downloaded from uh, digital engine monitors aboard these aircraft and uploaded to our platform for analysis. And most of these engine monitors capture information every second or every few seconds. Uh, they capture uh, data from a whole lot of sensors, uh, CHT, EGT, uh, uh, oil temperature, uh, oil pressure, air speed, all sorts of, uh, of, of um, parameters depending on how elaborate the engine monitoring system is. And all this stuff goes into, uh, into our database. So at this point we, we've got something like 200 billion captured data points in the database uh, for uh, uh, a million uh, 200,000 odd flights. A lot of data. So we've been we've been doing some interesting things with it, um, uh, and last time in, in part one of this webinar, I talked about some of the fun things that we we've done. We we, for example, did a study to um, uh, validate the 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 um, impression that that pilots have believed for a long time that the deck is stacked against us with regard to uh, to headwinds. Uh, being more numerous than tailwinds, we did a study of uh, of Cessna 182s that that showed that uh, um, on average the, uh, the the median ground speed that was experienced by these airplanes was seven and a half knots slower than the median true airspeed, meaning that 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 uh, on uh, in the aggregate uh, we're, we we're flying into a a seven and a half knot headwind obviously it varies on every flight, but but the deck is definitely stacked against us. I talked about some studies we did comparing cylinder head temperatures on Continental and Lycoming engines, uh, and validating the conjecture that that I had that uh, Lycoming's cylinder head temperatures sy sy systematically run hotter than Continental cylinder head temperatures by roughly 20 degrees, and there are some good reasons for that. Um, did a study uh, comparing the cylinder head temperature spreads between hottest and coolest cylinders uh, on a legacy aircraft designed in the late 50s versus uh, modern uh, piston aircraft uh, designed in the late 1990s 
Um, and as you can see, the, the, the newer designed airplanes have much, much better engineered cooling systems and much closer CHT spreads. Uh, we even did a, a study um, verifying the conjecture that there is a systemic problem in the cooling systems of Cessna 210s that cause cylinder number five to run much hotter than the others. So, at any rate, that, that, that's kind of the stuff we covered last time. But today, what I'd like to do is is continue and into some, I guess, more serious stuff uh, that we've been doing with the data, um, because we've been working hard to um, figure out how uh, this big database can be used to provide useful, actionable intelligence to aircraft owners, things that, 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 that they can use to detect problems in their aircraft, problems in the way they operate their aircraft, um, uh, and, and, and give them feedback that, that lets them do a better job of flying and maintaining the aircraft. And we've been doing a lot of a lot of work in this area, um, and um, uh, we're not we're, we're definitely not finished. This is a work in process. But I wanted to share with you um, some of what we've developed, a little bit about some of the stuff we're working on for the future, um, all tied together in in that this is that this is different ways of analyzing this this big database that that we've been collecting for the last four years um, to provide useful um, feedback useful intelligence uh, back to aircraft owners and the first thing that I'm going to talk to you about which is probably the most mature thing that that we have right now in this area is what we call a report card we launched a report card in um, 2015 uh, we beta tested it with a group of Cirrus aircraft and have gradually been expanding it to um, to the point that now um, a very large percentage of the aircraft that use our system are uh, are getting report cards and basically what the report card is is a, it's a periodic report um, that 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 gets emailed to the owner several times a year that um, that summarizes how uh, that aircraft is doing um, in terms of about a dozen different parameters that we analyze parameters affecting performance uh, efficiency longevity of the equipment um, and tries to highlight areas where uh, where there could be some improvement, either by fixing something wrong with the aircraft or by changing the way that the, that the pilot operates the aircraft. Now, of course, the report card doesn't look exactly like what I have on the screen. Actually, what the report card looks like is is this. This is an actual report card that, that was sent to... Um, uh, the owner of a Cirrus SR22 and I'm going to go through this report card with you so you can see the kind of information that 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 we that we have on it and the sort of analysis that we're doing it's a th there's a lot of information here we try to present it in in graphical form to make it um, more understandable and um, um, and so let me just kind of walk you through uh, this report card and, and so you can see uh, what kind of information it provides and how it's structured. Um, report card starts out with a header that identifies it. Um, I have obliterated the end number to protect the innocent uh, because as you'll see this particular aircraft has got some problems um, as that, that the report card kind of points up. Um, but if you'll if you just look at at what the header says, first of all, there's a word in there, cohort, which is um, uh, which is a, a a word that statisticians use. The 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 concept of this report card was uh, developed by um, my business partner uh, Chris Rather, who has a PhD in operations research. And uh, cohort is kind of a PhD sort of a word for this thing, but a, a cohort 
and statistics is a group of things that share a defining characteristic. In this case, we're talking about comparing this particular normally aspirated SR22 against um, a whole bunch of other normally aspirated SR22s that constitute the cohort in, in our database. And so what this header is saying is that this report card is comparing the results of this particular aircraft over 27 flights that occurred during a one-year period. This particular report card was pulled for a, a one-year look-back period. Um, and it's comparing this particular uh, 27 flights of this particular aircraft to 46,886 flights of 741 other normally aspirated SR-22s to see how this particular aircraft stacks up against a large group of similar aircraft. So effectively what we're doing in this report card is, is we're grading on the curve. We're, we're, we're basically saying here's how you did compared with uh, with a lot of, of of other aircraft owners who are operating the same kind of aircraft that you are. Um, the body of the report card, as you probably noticed, contains a whole bunch of these colorful thermometers. Um, this is one of them, and there are, I think, a dozen of them on this particular report card. But they're all structured in the same fashion. Um, and each, each one uh, uh, starts off with a description of what this particular thermometer is displaying. In this case, this one is displaying a percent power in cruise. Um, that's deceptively tricky from an analysis standpoint because we have a whole bunch of very complicated software that looks at these ten of, tens of thousands of data points for a flight and tries to determine what portion of the flight represented the longest cruise segment. And we're basically looking for a segment of the flight during which a, a bunch of things remain relatively steady, indicating that the aircraft what was in steady level flight during that period of time. We often, we often determine a bunch of different segments on a flight that meet those criteria, and, and we do our analysis based on the longest cruise segment that we can find in each particular flight. And in this case, we're analyzing, I, f I forgot, what 40 some odd flights of this aircraft. Um, all of the thermometers, uh, so, so the, the, the first thing is a description of what we're measuring. In this case, it's, it's percent power in cruise. Um, and then the thermometers, um, they're a little bit complicated, but there's a lot of information in them. And, and basically, what this particular thermometer is indicating, the, the, the color band represents the distribution of, in this case, percent power and cruise among the cohort of 741 different airplanes. The blue line in the middle represents the values from the particular aircraft for which is, this is a report card. So uh, what, the, what the color band is saying is that in this entire cohort of 741 Cirruses, we found cruise power settings ranging from a low of 45% power to a high of 90% power. Um, and that, um, uh, that 61.2% power represents the 50th percentile. In other words, that, that was kind of dead in the middle of this cohort. 56.8% um, was the 25th percentile, which means that 75% of, uh, of, of, of these flights that we analyzed um, were at above 56.8% power. 25% of them were less than 56.8% power, and so on. So this 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 color band represents the uh, the the spread and distribution of uh, percent power and cruise for the entire cohort. The the thin blue line in the middle of the thermometer represents what we saw for this particular Cirrus that we're giving the report card for. And in this case, the minimum 
uh, percent power that we found in crews for this aircraft was 57.2 percent. The highest was 75.8 percent, and the median, the blue dot in the, in the middle there, is 65.2 percent. Um, we use medians rather than averages for all of our analysis here because averages can get thrown way off by a single outlier. For example, um, if, if you look at the blue line, th there was one flight by this aircraft during which th that was only at 57.2 percent power, but that was probably a huge outlier because uh, 50 percent of his flights were at 65 percent power or above and the other 50 percent were at 65 percent power or below. Um, and so the 57 percent flight represented a big outlier and if we're using the average it, it would have thrown that point f quite far to the left. So median is a is a more accurate way of, of, of looking at these things. So we're comparing median values from the cohort to median values for, for this particular aircraft. And as you can see what this is saying is that that uh, on balance this guy is running um, pretty high power uh, compared to the cohort. Uh, his the 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 median uh, power he's running in cruise is more than 75 percent of his colleagues, and less than only 25 percent of his colleagues. So he's um, he, he's a bit of a lead foot here. He's running pretty high percentage of power. Then the last part of the thermometer, well, and, and at the bottom of, of each um, report card is a little legend that looks like this that, that, that helps decode what these thermometers mean in, 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 case, you, uh, in case you forget. Um, and then following each thermometer is uh, a, a section called Savvy Says where we we, we sort of give our analysis um, of what this particular thing all means. That in this in this case, we're saying uh, that he's his his cruise power settings is is uh, greater than seventy four percent of the cohort, which should make you go fast, but at the cost of reduced uh, cylinder longevity and also reduced fuel economy, actually. So anyway, each of these dozen thermometers have a description, the, the color band that depicts the actual data, and then a, a paragraph of analysis. And there's 12 of those on the report card. So let me just uh, quickly go through the, uh, the thermometers that were on this particular report card um, and give you an idea of, of, of how an owner can interpret this data. And, and try to get some sort of action plan from it. Um, so we're, we're, these are the, I, I've cut out all of the verbiage here and we're just looking at these thermometers. So, so let's go, go through them very quickly. Um, the one we were just looking at, percent power and cruise, as I said, he, he, he's um, uh, cruising at pretty high power compared to the, uh, the cohort. Um, and that's probably because he, he he would like to fly fast. That's usually the reason that you cruise at higher power. Um, yet if we look at his median cruise speed, we find that his median cruise speed is almost exactly at the 50th percentile of the cohort. So already there's a little red flag here. He's running higher power than most of his colleagues but he's not getting any higher airspeed than most of his colleagues. In fact, he's just right in the middle of the pack. If we look at the altitude he's flying, which could affect his cruiser, his true airspeed, we find that his median cruise altitude is about 7,000 feet MSL, and that is also right in the middle of the, of the pack of the cohort. So his altitude's uh, profile is typical of, of um, of, of other uh, aircraft of the same type. It, it's, it's not an outlier. He doesn't fly especially low or especially high. Um, if we look at his fuel efficiency, we find that it's quite mediocre. Um, he's getting 11.2 nautical miles per gallon on average over that year. Um, and it's down in the 38th percentile, meaning 62% of his colleagues got better fuel efficiency than he did. So now he's running high power, 
He's not getting higher airspeed. His fuel economy is not very good, probably because he's running higher power. Um, if we look at his cylinder head temperatures, and we, we analyze them both in climb and cruise, we find out that his cylinder head temperatures in both climb and cruise are pretty high uh, relative to other cirruses of the same kind. Um, uh, 75th percentile uh, in climb and 70th percentile in cruise. So he's running his cylinders warmer than average, which kind of is what you'd expect if you're running more power than average. And then finally, if we look at his CHT spread, we find that it is stellar. It's, it's much lower CHT spread. By that, I mean the difference between the hottest cylinder and the coldest cylinder CHT um, is much closer than most of his colleagues. In fact, it's way down in the 20th percentile. And in this case, as the thermometer shows, green being on the left side, the lower, the lower is better. Um, so it's the, the warm cylinder head temperatures are not due to the fact that he has any kind of cooling system problem. They're just being caused by the fact that he's running a lot of power. So if we summarize everything we've learned from this report card, we find that this owner is cruising at high power. He's getting poor fuel economy. His CHTs are high. Um, and he's not getting any, any extra airspeed to show for it. Um, that's not a good thing. So what what could you take away from a report card like this? Well, maybe he should have his aircraft rigging checked and maybe he should work on his leaning technique. Maybe he isn't isn't uh, leaning appropriately. Um, but at any rate, it's, it's, it, this is the kind of, of information that we can get back by analyzing the data that gives information to the owners that, that they can act upon uh, and, um, um, and, and possibly um, have some action taken to fix the aircraft, perhaps a rigging check, and in many cases take some action to change the way they're operating the aircraft, um, like maybe leaning a little bit better. Now, at present, the um, owners uh, who are using our service get these report cards several times a year. Um, how often they get them per year kind of depends on how much they fly because we won't normally won't issue a report card uh, unless we've gotten at least 12 new flights. Um, and we are just about to launch a, a new capability um, that a lot would allow owners to pull a report card anytime they want on demand uh, by going to a logging on to a particular web page and they could specify what period of time they want the analysis for. One of the things we think this will be useful for is uh, for owners who are trying to sell their airplane. And uh, and they could pull a report card and pro pro provide it to prospective buyers, kind of like a Carfax report. Because uh, when people are buying an airplane, they always, you know, have misgivings about well, how how did the how did the last guy operate it? You know, was he did he baby the engine? Did he abuse the engine? Stuff like that. And the best way to answer that question would be to pull a report card and provide it to the prospective buyer so that they could see exactly how we operated the aircraft. So we, we are about to provide this ability to pull report cards on demand. Um, however, sometimes we find data that we, that we think is sufficiently important um, that it can't wait until the next report card comes out. And when we find data like that, um, we send the owner uh, an alert by email. And here's an example of what an alert looks like. An alert, again, is un unlike the report card, an alert is something that is triggered on condition when we find something that we think is of concern. Um, now, we don't typically send an alert based on a single flight, but if we see several consecutive flights that have what we think is a, cons a, a significant problem, 
um, then we'll then we'll issue an alert to the uh, to the owner. Uh, here's a here's a, here's an actual alert again. I've obfuscated the end number. This one was a was a, a Mooney. Um, uh, let's see, M20J. That's a like a Mooney 201 or something. I think um, normally aspirated Mooney with an IO3 360 light combing engine. Um, and we sent an alert to this guy because we determined that over a series of flights, um, this was actually 35 flights, his um, maximum CHT um, and his his maximum CHT in, in climb, in cruise, and his oil temperature, all three of them were above the 95th percentile level. So this engine was running really, really hot, and we felt that we needed to bring that to his attention. So the system issued him um, an alert uh, pointing out that, that this is not good stuff and uh, uh, with a bunch of advice about what to do about it. Uh, so these are, these are alerts. I, you know, I like to think about the report card as something you get at the end of, a, of every semester, and a, an alert is like being called into the principal's office, if you will. That's <laughs> uh, not don't take that too literally, but that's kind of the general concept. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about in, in regard to this is something I may have mentioned in a previous uh, webinar, but it kind of fits right in here. And that's a program that we have called FEVA, Failing Exhaust Valve Analytics. And um, uh, this is something that we came up with a few years ago based on an observation that I had made uh, more than 10 years ago that when an exhaust valve is on the verge of failure um, there is a noticeable um, warning pattern, a noticeable signature that one can detect in the EGT data that can provide uh, advanced warning of impending exhaust valve failure. Doesn't warn of every exhaust valve failure, but it, it warns of a, of a lot of them. Kind of depends on, on how they fail, but um, here's, here's an example which is very easy to see. Um, this is uh, data from uh, one of the engines on a Cessna 340, and um, it was actually the, the, the engine from which that ugly looking exhaust valve that was on the previous slide uh, was taken. And if you look at the data, you can see that cylinder number three has a different looking EGT pattern than, 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 the, uh, than the five other cylinders. Um, and this particular pattern is uh, characteristic of an impending exhaust valve failure. What we're looking for and what, what our software algorithm uh, that's in our platform looks for is a slow rhythmic EGT oscillation um, that's at least 20 degrees Fahrenheit uh, peak to peak um, and which has which is very rhythmic and has a frequency of roughly one cycle per minute so it's slow it's rhythmic and it has and it's at least a 20 degree variation uh, up and down now 20 degrees isn't very much when you consider that this is a 20 degree variation of a 1600 degree exhaust gas, gas temperature. So it's a very small percentage variation, but it can be seen, usually can be seen quite readily in the data, and it's something that's admissible to, uh, to an algorithm that can detect it automatically. So we, we created a software algorithm in our, in our uh, platform such that anytime um, an aircraft owner uploads their engine monitor data to our system. Every flight is scanned, looking for a bunch of things. But one of the things that it, it, the software looks for is this particular um, signature indicating a failing exhaust valve. And if we find it, then we send the uh, the owner an alert and suggest that he, at the earliest possible opportunity, have a mechanic stick a bore scope in the cylinder, and uh, verify whether whether or not that 
valve actually look, looks like it's failing because we want to head this off before it happens. Now in the case of the 340 that we're looking at here, unfortunately that, that didn't happen and the reason was that this owner was not in the habit of uploading his data to our system on a regular basis and he actually uploaded the data after it happened. And, um, it was kind of like, well, why did my valve fail? And he uploaded his data. And, you know, in retrospect, we could see very clearly that, that, that the EGT was, were giving warning of impending valve failure, except that, that, that that data hadn't been loaded into the system, so we couldn't, we couldn't detect it before it happened. Um, the next one I'm going to show you is, is uh, a little more interesting, and it has a, a slightly better outcome. Um, this this is EGT data from a Cirrus SR22, and this I mean if you just look at it, it's a total mess, and it's very hard to make very much of it except that it just looks like a whole bunch of noise. But the um, uh, but the FIVA algorithm is is actually pretty good at at at, at making sense of this kind of stuff. And in fact, what the FIVA algorithm does is look at each cylinder individually. And if you look here, what I've done is I've taken cylinder number five out of the group and, and graphed it separately. So the bottom, the bottom graph here shows cylinder number five's EGT. The top graph shows the other five cylinders' EGTs. You can see cylinder number five looks totally different than the other five cylinders. And in fact, it meets it meets the, the the FIVA criteria. So we did issue an alert for this particular aircraft, this this Cirrus, and um, and the owner had a borescope inspection done, and it turned out the the valve was was badly burned. This is a picture that was taken after the cylinder was pulled off the airplane, but you can see what that valve looked like, and. Um, um, th there's a, a really bad hot spot on this exhaust valve right here that if the valve had stayed in service for another 10 or 20 hours it, it would have failed that that chunk of of the exhaust valve would have broken off and shut them down the cylinder and so on um, so but it, it was pretty obvious in the uh, in the um, engine monitor data that, that this valve was getting sick uh, and it, in this case it was Detected and uh, and uh, caught before the before the valve actually failed, so it didn't have any operational consequences. <clears throat> okay, let's see some of the things that we're working on right now. Um, we're expanding the 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 number of makes and models of aircraft uh, for which we uh, are able to send out report cards, and right now we're we're able to send out report cards for the. The majority of the aircraft that uh, uh, that use our system. The, the reason that we have to do it by make and model is that for for each engine we have to create a mathematical model of that engine so that we can figure out things like percent power and so on from the data that's collected. Uh, so there's quite a bit of software that has to be done. Um, we're adding some additional um, parameters. Uh, um, Tim, are you able to hear me okay? Because I just got a warning that I may be experiencing difficulties. I got you loud and clear, Mike. Yep, you're coming through just fine on my end, and I have no other reports from anybody that they're experiencing any issues with your audio. Okay, I don't know why, but go to webinar, just put up a big red flag. <laughs> so I thought I'd ask. It just went away, so I don't know what it was. At any rate, um, uh, we're, we're adding some more parameters to the report to the report card uh, all the time. One of the more interesting ones that we're working on is what we call a corrosion risk index. Actually, the, the report card right now has um, a, um, a disuse index, which I, I didn't show you, that um, for aircraft that have engine monitors that report um, I'll take that back. Um, we we have a something on the report card that that indicates how long the aircraft has sits unflown between flights, and compares it with how long the aircraft sits unflown between flights for for the cohort. In other words, it's kind of an index of activity or inactivity. 
Um, we're, what we're working on right now is to enhance that into what we call a corrosion risk index, where for aircraft that have engine monitors that report GPS data, like most of the most of the Cirruses do, most of the glass cockpit airplanes do, um, where we would not only know how long the aircraft was uh, was inactive, but we would know geographically where it was inactive. Um, we 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 take our inactivity information and um, apply it to a uh, a digital map of the United States that plots the corrosion risk. Uh, in other words, you know, being being inactive in Tucson is not a terribly bad thing. Being inactive in Tampa, Florida, is a very bad thing. So, the corrosion risk index will factor in both the amount of inactivity of the aircraft and where that inactivity took place geographically uh, to create a, a composite index that we call a corrosion risk index and be able to compare it uh, again against the cohort of, of, of other airplanes. Um, as I mentioned, we're just about to release on-demand report cards. The report cards right now are what we call push report cards where we periodically send them uh, to, uh, to to aircraft owners via email, um, but what we're, we're about to release is the ability to pull report cards on demand uh, by logging into a website and, and simply making a request for a report card uh, for a particular airplane over a particular period of time and the report card gets generated and returned on the spot. And we think that'll be useful for a lot of things, and but in particular this business about um, people who are wanting to sell airplanes and be able to provide evidence to prospective buyers that that with you know how how well the aircraft was was operated or how abusively it was operated. Um, another thing that we're just starting to work on um, is another uh, algorithm, kind of like the FIVA algorithm, but this one instead of looking for failing exhaust valves, uh, we'll be looking for uh, detonation and pre-ignition events so that we can warn owners if we detect what looks like a detonation or pre-ignition event in their data uh, so that they can again get a mechanic to take a top spark plug out, stick a bore scope in there and see if there was any damage to the equipment. So that's the stuff we're working on. It's, uh, it's kind of leading edge. It's kind of a lot of fun. Uh, I think that um, this is stuff that, that will hopefully prove useful to aircraft owners and, and we're, we're constantly expanding the scope of, of the analysis that we do and report back uh, to try to do everything we can to make this data that we're collecting useful to the aircraft owners who are contributing the data. Uh, and so Tim, that's, uh, that's all I have uh, but we can open it up for questions if you like. Okay, Mike, thanks. Hey, we've had a number of people ask questions. If there's any report cards available for experimental aircraft, uh, Bob's wondering about Velocity, uh, Michael's wondering about a Glass Air Sportsman, uh, Wayne's wondering about um, Rotex powered RV-12. Good question. I wish I had the answer to that. Um, I th th those are questions that um, we'll have we'll have to go to our savvy analysis support team. I, I actually don't know exactly the list of aircraft. I mean, I know we're doing tons of RVs and stuff, but I I I just can't tell you specifically. It has really more to do with the uh, uh, with what power plant the the aircraft has. If, if the air airplanes that are using you know, like homing O320s and O360s, we we it's are, are real easy for us because we have models for those. Um, I don't think, but I could be wrong. I don't think we have a mathematical model for Rotex uh, in the system yet. Um, but um, um, those are uh, uh, questions that uh, if 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 you email a, a question to uh, support at SavvyAnalysis.com um, that'll get to the right people who, who will be able to, to give you an answer to that. Um, 
I, I wish I I wish I had a list of exactly what airplanes we support, but and I probably should have done my homework, but but I I don't uh, I don't have that. Okay. Well, Larry chimed in. He says I fly a Vans RV six A with an IO three sixty, and got my first report card several weeks ago. Oh, cool. So there you have one experimental yeah, RV six A. No, we, 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 like I say, I know we do tons of RVs because we we we've, we've got lots and lots of RVs using our system. You know, another problem that I, uh, Tim I might just mention is that if you fly a, an oddball aircraft that, that of of which we have very few uh, using our system. Um, you know, we we can probably generate a report card for you, but the cohort's going to be awfully small, and the value of the data probably won't be nearly as great. The the you know we're grading on the curve, so um, the the value of this thing comes from having lots of different uh, aircraft of the same general type to compare against. Um, so that's kind of why our focus has been on the aircraft that 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 most frequently are, are using our system and that includes you know most of the common certificated aircraft and certainly RVs we've got tons of RVs in our system and again I, I don't know exactly which aircraft we have the ability to generate report cards on um, but um, but but you could you could pose the question to um, uh, to support at SavvyAnalysis.com, and we're we're adding new aircraft all the time. Um, it's just you know, as I said, inherently, the smaller the cohort, the less uh, you know, the less valuable the, the 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 data that's reported back. Is there a minimum number of aircraft to make up a cohort? I don't think so formally. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, and, I, 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 I wish I had had a list in front of me of, of, of what kinds of aircraft we are providing report cards to. I know it's majority the, the people who use our, our system, but I, I just don't know by specific make and model. Yeah. W will that data be available to, um, to somebody in the cohort? Peter's wondering, can a potential f uh, customer find out what size the current cohort is for their aircraft? Well, it's it's shown on every report card that we generate. Um, I, I don't know that there's a way of finding out un, un, unless you're actually receiving report cards. <laughs> okay. And and Vince is wondering again, again. I mean, if you have a question like that, if it's like how how many X's do you have in your system? I'm interested in possibly, uh, you know, receiving report cards. I'm sure that that. Th those that can be answered because the support people can run a real quick query and find out how many. But I, I don't think you can. I don't think there's a place that you could log in and do it yourself. Okay. And Vince is saying the report card seems to imply that the 50th percentile is the best place to operate the aircraft slash engine combination. That may or may not be the be true depending upon. Uh, what your huge database, you know, teaches over time. Is there a I, I, learned? I, I, don't, I, I don't think the report card implies that at all, and that's certainly not a correct um, inference. Um, in fact, if you looked at those thermometers, the the thermometers are caliber, or are, are, they they tend to have, they have a color band that on most of them that runs from green to red, and some of them. Green is on the left and red is on the right, and some of them green is on the uh, on the right and red is on the left. Uh, and when it's that way, it sort of implies that you know the the higher the better or the lower the better. Some of the thermometers don't have a color band; they're blue all the way across, which like the altitude one, where we're not we're not saying that that high is better or low is better. We're 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 sort of taking the you know saying we're just telling you where you fall on that. Spectrum, but we're not making any editorial comments about about goodness or badness. But it's certainly in no way is it a reasonable inference that we're saying that the 50 percentile point is the best place to be. That that's not that's certainly not the case at all. I mean, 
50, you know, I mean, take, take for example, fuel economy, nautical miles per gallon, you know, presumably lower is better. You know, what, if, if I was in the 25th percentile on efficiency on, on nautical miles per gallon, I would be happier than if I was at the 50th percentile. So it's, that's, I don't think that's a reasonable inference at all. And Jerry's wondering, how often do you recommend downloading data? Well, uh, I, I, I think I talked about that uh, in last month. Um, in a perfect world, we would like to see data downloaded after every flight because we, we would like to be able to see it and analyze on a timely basis. And one of the things that we're in the very early stages of working on is a is a pilot project with with Dynon um, to see if we can't get um, aircraft that have Dynon Skyviews um, to automatically transmit their data into us at the at the end of every flight. The the Dynon Skyview happens to have Wi-Fi built in, and most most uh, pilots nowadays carry uh, an an iPhone or an Android phone that is capable of getting data over a Wi-Fi connection and then transmitting it into the internet. Um, so in a perfect world, the airplane would, would, would phone home and dump its data after every flight. Most that, that, that technology is not available yet, unfortunately. And so at the moment, the, the pilot has to take manual action to dump the data. Um, and, you know, we, we would like to see them do that every couple of flights. Uh, because I just hate things like that Cessna 340 that I showed you where we could have warned the guy that he had an exhaust valve coming apart if he had been sending in his data for analysis on a regular basis uh, but he wasn't and so we weren't able to we weren't able to alert him to the problem until the valve actually failed um, so I mean it's the kind of thing at, at the very least w the, it ought to be something that's done at every oil change, just the same way you take a sample and send it to the lab for oil analysis. You ought to dump the data in and send it into the system. But I, I would prefer to see it more often than that. And Michael's wondering, uh, how do you sign up for the service and how much does it cost and anything I can do myself with the data? Sure, absolutely. Um, right now, Savvy Analysis um, offers two different levels of service, one free and, and one paid. And we're, uh, we're working on a third level that, that kind of falls in between. Um, but let me just describe that. The, the, the use of the basic platform is free. Um, you can open an account at no cost. You can upload your data at no cost. You can use all of the analysis tools, the same ones that, that we use. Um, on the system at, at no cost. Your data, when you upload it, is um, automatically scanned for high CHTs and for uh, failing exhaust valve uh, FIVA alerts. And um, we're, like I say, we're working on a detonation pre-ignition detector that we'll be adding to the software. All of that stuff is available to, to free users. Um, if you subscribe to the paid service, which is uh, let's see, $129 a year for uh, single-engine aircraft, um, then you get a whole bunch of stuff. You get first of all, you get the ability to request our staff of analysts to look at your data and and provide you an analytical report uh, where where one of our analysts, we have a team of analysts who specialize in this stuff, examine your data um, and, and provide you a very comprehensive report on how everything looks and whether they recommend any, any maintenance changes, any operational changes, that sort of thing. Um, you also get report cards. Uh, report cards are, present, are being sent out only to paid subscribers. Uh, alerts go out to everybody. Because uh, we're we're certainly not going to 
if our computer det detects something unsafe, we're, we're, we're not going to say, oh, well, you're not a paid subscriber. We're not going to tell you. We, we provide alerts to everybody. But um, the uh, report cards are, are only for paid subscribers. Um, we have been talking about and pretty much made a decision to introduce um, an intermediate level service that would be cheaper than $129 a, a year uh, and, and would include things like the report card and so on, but it would not include the human at, uh, analysis, which is what costs us a lot of money. So that's not available yet, but that's it, we made a decision to do that, and that will be be deployed sometime in the next in the coming months I can't tell you exactly when um, so that's that's the deal but but um, and, and you can you can start out with a free account and then if you decide you subsequently want to want to change it to a to to the to the paid account which we call savvy analysis pro you can do that anytime so that that's kind of how it works Okay. Mark's wondering, does the FIVA algorithm work across different make and models engines? Yes, and it's generic. The same accuracy? Yeah, it, it, it works on everything. It's uh, Basically, what the FIVA algorithm depends on is um, simply the fact that uh, almost all, well, I shouldn't say almost all aircraft engines, but certainly all Lycomies and Continentals and, and engines of that sort um, have rotator caps on the exhaust valve. So the exhaust valve rotates uh, when the engine's running, rotates fairly slowly, about one revolution a minute. And so if the valve has a hot spot developing where exhaust gas is leaking past the valve at some point, um, that hot spot will rotate um, around uh, at about a revolution a minute or so because of the rotator cap. And th that the rotation of the leak uh, moving between hotter and colder parts of the combustion chamber is what causes that small but but um, fairly unique um, slow rhythmic ETT oscillation. That is what our FIVA algorithm looks for in detecting uh, possible exhaust valve failure. So I guess the answer is, is as, as long as the engine has exhaust valves with rotator caps on them, uh, the FIVA algorithm should work. Now it doesn't it doesn't detect every kind of exhaust valve failure. There are, there are cases where exhaust valves develop three or four different hot spots, uh, and so the the, the EGT vary, uh, oscillation winds up being much faster and much shallower and and doesn't trigger our detection algorithm. But the overwhelming majority of the time when an exhaust valve burns, it burns because it's developing a hot spot in one particular location, kind of like the one I showed you on the slide. And th those are the kinds of failures, and that's the most common failure mode that the FIVA algorithm will detect. Paul's wondering, uh, what if you're flying a mix of local flights, practice approaches, and cross-country flights? Is the report card more meaningful for longer flights? Well, it depends on what you mean meaningful. The, there, some of the thermometers um, are ones that are measuring things during the cruise phase. And um, we, we, we won't consider that that you ever got to cruise phase unless we can find unless the algorithm that is doing the analysis finds a steady state portion of the flight of some minimum length I forget I forget what it was it was probably something like 10 minutes or something and if the if the flight is one that doesn't have a stable segment that's at least whatever that number is 10 minutes long or something um, then it the, the algorithm basically says this this flight didn't have a cruise segment, so we can't do any analysis of the, you know, cruise phase analysis on it. Um, that's kind of how it works. Okay. Jerry's wondering, any chance this kind of information could be used to move the FAA from annuals to just-in-time maintenance? <laughs> oh, man. There's a $64,000 question. <laughs> um, boy, that that's dating me. It's probably a $640,000 question now. Huh? <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm not holding my breath. Um, we, 
there, there have been noises in the FAA from time to time. Uh, we we had a a big um, uh, summit meeting with the FAA Engine Propeller Directorate uh, a little over a year ago, um, where they asked me to make a presentation to to the to the group and and uh, uh, a bunch of the FAA people expressed interest. Um, and we're we're trying to set up a second summit meeting that will happen sometime later this year to continue uh, some of those conversations. Um, but um, uh, my, you know, my guess is that 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 any movement in that direction, much as I would be thrilled by it, uh, is is the sort of thing that that would take, you know. Ten or twenty years to accomplish the 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 pace of change uh, at the FAA tends to be pretty glacial. Right, but it's a start. Yes, yeah, we have to keep fighting the good fight. That's exactly right. Can't give and, up. You know, and 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 that's why you know it it it, it it's it, the FAA has expressed. An interest over the years in having more data about what general aviation is doing. Now that we have a whole bunch of data, we 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 have to see if they're actually willing to put their money where their mouth is and actually do something with it. And that's that's an ongoing discussion. Hey, Drew's wondering anecdotally, a lot of valve failures on M20Js Moonies are at the neck rather than the valve edge. This is difficult to bore scope, but possible. Is there any data analysis that would show the beginning of valve neck failure? Um, I have to plead ignorance on that. Um, my, my own personal uh, hands-on experience is predominantly with Continental engines, uh, which have uh, solid stem exhaust valves that very, very, very rarely um, have have breakage. Um, the Lycomings use sodium-filled hollow stem sodium-filled exhaust valves, uh, and so that the stem is not as robust as it is on a solid stem valve. And uh, but I have just have not. I don't have enough personal hands-on experience working on Lycomings to really be able to comment on that. Okay, and uh, George is uh, wondering what were the outcomes of the two alerts that you gave in your presentation? The and, two as alerts. and as a follow-up, the record of alert interventions having a positive outcome. Well, you know, I, with respect to the, the two FEVA alerts, um, as I said, one of them w was generated too late to help because the guy didn't upload his data until after he had the failure. In the second one, we had a good outcome. We, we warned the owner. Uh, he had a bore scope inspection, verified that the valve was burning, and pulled the cylinder, sent us some pictures. So the, the second one had a good outcome. The first one didn't have a good outcome because the owner was not in the habit of regularly downloading the data. As far as the Mooney alert, where we alerted him that all of his temperatures were through the roof, um, I'm not sure we ever got any follow-up on that guy, so I don't really know what happened. John's wondering, what software do I need to download data for your system? I'm using an EI monitor and recording system. Um, well, I don't know exactly what monitor he's using. The, the newer Electronic International um, monitors, like the uh, CGM30 and the MVP50, have the ability to plug a, a, a USB thumb drive into a USB socket on the instrument and download the data. The old UBG16 ones use some sort of a serial port arrangement, and I honestly don't know what what uh, software is used to uh, to extract the the data out of those the UG, UBG16s. Um, I, I can't answer that. 
Okay. Uh, Frederick is wondering on the older, less capable engine monitors, is the information from a report card as valuable? He has an EDM 760, no airspeed. Um, yeah, I have an EDM 760 as well. The, 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 the value of the report card increases as the number of parameters that are captured increase, of course. For instance, um, th there's a lot of stuff that we can do with, with just uh, CHTs and EGTs. Uh, if we have fuel flow, we can do more. We can do fuel economy stuff. If we have air data, we can do more. We can we can you know look at at, at true air speeds and stuff. Um, uh, the 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 our analysis software basically looks at what data is being captured and then does the best it can. For for example, um, if we don't have true air speed data being captured, but we do have GPS ground speed data, then we'll use that. If we don't have GPS ground speed data either, but we have GPS coordinates, we'll use those to calculate ground speed. Um, if we don't have any of that stuff, then we can't do anything with with, with speed. So the, the, a report card generated on an aircraft that, that that is capturing only EGTs and CHTs and nothing else is going to be a pretty short report card because a lot of the of the thermometers that uh, that we would generate for a more for for an aircraft with a more robust uh, system will 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 not be there because there just isn't any data to support them. But we we do the best we can with the data that we have. James is wondering, are there any insurance companies getting access to this data to use for providing feedback to their clients? No, 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 no insurance company has made any request about that. Um, I've sort of been waiting for the day that the NTSB starts asking us for to, to look at the data, but that hasn't happened yet either. <laughs> hmm. And uh, we have had one or two cases uh, in which either plaintiff or defense lawyers have have asked to look at data, um, and uh, uh, we will provide that information with the data de-identified to them. Um, but you know, again, this is is pretty new stuff. the The existence of it is not that widely known in the industry yet, and I would expect over time there will be more and more people interested in employing the data for um, various purposes and uh, we have um, uh, privacy agreements for, for our users that basically say we will never disclose any information to any third party that would let them identify who you are or your airplane but if, if people want aggregate analysis of of uh, large cohorts of data that that don't have any identifying information then then we're, we're free to be able to do that because we frankly would like this data to be used in the most useful ways it possibly can be and if it can be used by the aviation safety community NTSB and so on um, for for bona fide safety purposes we're we're we would enthusiastically support that Cool. Greg's wondering, are report cards available for any aircraft with carbureted engines? Of course. Like Cessna okay. 182s, of course. Yeah. And Thomas is wondering, what is the least horsepower engines you uh, do typically monitoring on? Well, I don't know that there's a good answer for that. I mean, typically the small light combings are 160, 180 horsepower. Um, we do lots of those. Um, we might, I don't know, maybe we, it's, uh, I would not be surprised if, we, if we're doing some 100 horsepower engines, Cessna 150s and that sort of thing, although I don't know that for a fact. We have to check. Um, but there isn't any particular reason that there should be a low or a high horsepower limit that would affect whether we do report cards or not. Mm -hmm. 
George is wondering, does your data indicate differences between engine operations or parameters for stock engines versus those with power flow exhaust installed? I don't think that I don't think that we know whether a particular aircraft has a has a power flow exhaust installed or not. That that's a good question, but um, I don't believe that any information is the every when when you sign up for the service, you you do fill out an aircraft uh, a profile, and the profile um, you know has asks you for some contact information so we can send you stuff. Um, information about the aircraft, information about the engine or engines, and information about what kind of engine monitoring equipment you're using. Um, but uh, besides, you know, for the engine, besides besides the, the manufacturer um, make and model of the engine, um, I don't think we, we drill down any further than that. I don't think we ask about, you know, whether you've got a you know, one of the mags is an EMAG or whether you have a power flow exhaust on it. I don't think we know that. Okay. Walt's wondering, um, is it possible detect, to detect failing or failed sensor probes leading to incorrect data? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We do that all the time. When, um, it's Usually, when you look at edge monitor data graphically, it's it's very obvious whether there's whether it's a true anomaly or whether it's a, a bad probe, um, it's usually very easy to tell the difference. Hmm, okay, just a comment from James here. He says the the download software for the older EI systems is called DRS one and is available free on EI's website. Thank you. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see here. Um, James is wondering, are you going to have to limit the different makes and models of aircraft, say by age or number manufactured? No, I don't see any reason w that we would. We, we would like to be able to provide report cards to, to uh, as, as many of the users as we possibly can. The only limitation is the one that I talked about before, which is that if you have an oddball aircraft and there and and the cohort size is is you know one <laughs> or three, then the report card isn't going to be terribly useful because there isn't very much information to compare your aircraft against. Um, so it's the, the the value of the report card lies. In in some sense, lies in the size of the cohort that we have to compare it against. Hmm. That leads into Mark's comment. He says the lack of standardization in the experimental world would reduce the value of this data, especially if um, your aircraft has significant modifications beyond the basic plans. Well, I think that's probably an accurate statement. Um, fortunately, there. Are you know, there's a pretty big population of, of RVs that are moderately well standardized, and and uh, we have a lot of them in our system, and we generate a lot of report cards for them. Um, but yeah, absolutely, the, 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 there's there's no free lunch in this business. If if you've got a one of a kind aircraft, it's very hard to compare it against other of its kind, which is really what we're doing with the report card. I mean, we'll st the alerts and so on will still be useful for an aircraft like that, but the report card will be less useful. Hmm. Walt is uh, asking, if an engine analyzer is transferred to another type of airplane, does it need to be registered so your software can analyze the data correctly on the new aircraft? Well, the, the, the we would need a new aircraft profile, and the system does allow... Um, uh, users to register more than one aircraft profile. I mean, some some people own more than one aircraft, and the so system will allow you to log on and and register several different aircraft profiles. Mm -hmm. When you upload the data to us, you 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 
you, you identify which, which of your aircraft profiles the data is for. Okay, and Greg's wondering, does the maximum CHT temperature on the report card represent the maximum single value for any cylinder during the flight or the maximum average temperature for any cylinder during the flight? Neither. It's the, it's the, it, it's the median, not the average. Um, but, but, you know, a single point exceedance will not really be reflected in the report card data. Now, when, when you go to the platform uh, and you upload data to the system, one of the things the system does is it flags flights that have any CHT data above a red line threshold that you get to set. So if you set the, the threshold at 400 degrees, for example, then any flight that you upload that has any CHT data exceeding 400 degrees will, will be immediately flagged. Um, that's not true of the report card. The report card works on median data, so it's, it's not thrown off by single point exceedances or just a few points. It's you know it especially for things like alerts. It's very important to us not to be generating false positives. So we do everything we can to kind of smooth the data out. Now that that won't be true for things, for example, like uh, detonation pre-ignition detection, which are inherently transient phenomena. We're not going to require that you be in detonation for four hours <laughs> before we report it or anything. But um, for things like CHT and so on, we we don't. Uh, we were for the report card we're using median values okay and and Smirty is uh, wondering based on the alert you provide are you able to suggest when an engine is likely to fail if no corrections are made no Okay, let's get to another one here. Um, that was probably Dixon. the shortest answer I've ever given to a question. I know. I got to quick go back and try to find one now. <laughs> I threw you. I threw off your rhythm there, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Dixon's wondering: Have the engine manufacturers shown any interest in your data? Not yet. Actually, the, the one manufacturer showed a lot of interest in our data, and that was ECI. But, but then ECI went away. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's see here. Got a question. Uh, Brian, he's, he's talking about the uh, picture you had on the uh, valve. He says the valve damage picture also showed a minor crack in the cylinder head, and he had never seen a cylinder head internal that clean before. Was it cleaned before the picture was taken, he wonders. Um, I'm not sure. I wouldn't be surprised. The, the, that, that particular picture that I used on the slide was not a borescope picture. That was a picture taken after the cylinder was removed, so it could, it could possibly have been cleaned. I don't know. I'd have to examine it. A couple of people are wondering here about the SR-22 example and um, um, you know the scenario laid out with their report card. Could it be that that particular aircraft was just flowing around heavy? It was just a heavy aircraft. Well, I suppose I, I, I suppose that could have had some influence on it. I don't. Um, we don't have any way of. Obviously, that's not instrumented. That's so we, we don't have any way of knowing what the gross weight of the aircraft is that's not captured by any engine monitor system that I know of. Um, we, I use the Cirrus as an example for two reasons. One is that we've got lots of them in the system um, and second that they are exceedingly well instrumented so we, we they capture lots and lots and lots of data parameters and so we're able to do a, an especially good job of analysis on the Cirrus just because we have a lot to work with. Um, but weight is not something that's implemented. That's uh, that's instrumented. 
Okay, Smurry's asking, if I follow the aircraft OEM recommendation for power settings, et cetera, and recommended maintenance schedules, why do I need the report card? <laughs> I don't even know where to start on that. First of all, if you, if you follow the manufacturer's uh, power settings and everything and leaning procedures, you're probably doing do, not doing things very well because most of the most of those manuals are pretty brain damaged, but uh, that that really doesn't answer your question at all. Um, I, I guess I guess I guess I would just have to turn around and say, well, nobody said you needed a report card. Um, I just think it's very useful for people to uh, to to be able to look at the, the, the at, at data. It's kind of like saying, well, why do I need oil analysis? Well, you don't. Um, but if something's going wrong, it, it, it'll give you an early heads up, and most people think that's worthwhile. Right. All right. Sometimes it's it's good to be compared to everybody else, to know if you're out of sync with everybody else, right. and that might give you an indication that oh, you have a problem. So that's kind of what this is all and about. A, and a, and a, yeah, I mean that that Cirrus we looked at, he, he there was anything wrong with that Cirrus that met like any alert criteria. We 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 were, weren't. We were pestering him with alerts saying, oh, my God, something's terrible is happening with your airplane. You're going to fall out of the sky. It's not like that. Um, we just provided, you know, a bunch of, of data that compared various parameters of his aircraft with others of, of that ilk and kind of leave it, leave it up to him to decide you know, he might. He maybe he looked at the report card and says, "Oh, yeah, that's because I always carry four people in a in a baggage compartment full of anvils." I don't know. Um, <laughs> that, that's that's not our. You know, we we can't we can't comment on that. We can just provide him the the data. Yep. Yep. Hey, Hal's wondering, do you have any data on alternate fuels, the new low lead fuel? Will you be willing to lend your services to analyze these fuels and their effect on engines once available for general use? Oh, we'll 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 make our data available for any anything that we think will be beneficial to to the GA community. Uh, the only thing I know of with alternate fuels right now is just was was just sort of an anecdotal thing. Um, uh, Steve Ells, who writes the 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 maintenance column for sport aviation now, I guess, um, ran a test in his uh, Comanche, his Piper Comanche, where he, he um, I think it was Swift Fuel. I think he, he put, he filled up one of the tanks with Swift Fuel and had the other tank full of regular 100 low lead and went out and did a bunch of test flights and switched tanks back and forth between the, the, the Swift Fuel and the 100 low lead and at the conclusion of all of his test flights, he he dumped his data and sent it to us, and 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 it was sent to our lead analyst Joe Godfrey to say, you know, do you see any difference in any of the any any, any of the engine parameters between the, the Swift Fuel and the Hunter Low Lead? And the answer was no, it couldn't couldn't tell the difference. You could you could not tell from the engine monitor data which which fuel was being used. So which was the answer he was you know kind of hoping to hear. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of offhand that we've done with alternative fuels. Cool. But awesome. but sure, we would be happy to um, make our data de-identified data available to you know the FAA or whoever was interested if that was gonna what would help them. Mm -hmm. Cool. Paul's wondering. I religiously download my data, but I do not religiously look at every flight. If I sign up for your service, how many flights should I upload? Ten All flights? of them. All of them. Okay. I mean, you should, you should upload every flight every chance you get. Um, and if you, I mean, you, for, first of all, the reason to do that is because the analysis software on Savvy Analysis is vastly more powerful than the software that 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 people are using on their PCs and stuff like that. Um, it's 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 by far the best analysis platform around. It works on any computer because it's completely it's completely web based. So it'll it'll work on any computer with a web browser, whether it's a you know a Mac or an iPad or or a PC or whatever. Um, and it does um, 
a certain amount of artificial intelligence, you know, automated scanning of the data as as it's being uploaded, and we're continuing to add more and more of that artificial intelligence. Like I say, we're working on a detonation pre-ignition detection algorithm right now. Um, so there's lots of good reasons to do that, and you know, probably the best reason is that that it's free. <laughs> so why not? Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. Hey, Anthony's wondering, um, he says, I fly a aerobatic pits with an IL-360A1A. My cohort would be one. So is, it possible, <laughs> so is it possible to have a report card that compares other aircraft with the same engine and different airframes? The Mooney M20J, Cessna 177, and many others have the same engine. Naturally, some of the data would be invalid, but surely the basic engine data would be valid. Um, well, you know, that's a really good question. The answer is, I don't think we have the ability to do that right now, but, uh, and it would not have been a reasonable thing to do with the periodic push report cards, but it, just offhand, and I'd have to talk to, to my colleague, Chris, about it, I, I don't see any inherent reason why that would not be a reasonable thing to do on these on-demand report cards that we're just about to release, uh, where where you can you basically tell it you know what period of time you want the report card for. Uh, I don't see any reason why you couldn't, if you, if why it would be unreasonable to let somebody specify what cohort they wanted to use for the comparison purposes. That's a very interesting idea. And what I will do is I, I meet with Chris every Sunday, and I will bring that idea up to him uh, next Sunday and see if it flies. It sounds to me like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. It might be an interesting interesting capability to, to have. So I like that idea. I'm, I've written it down, and I will review it with Chris on Sunday and see if maybe we can do it. Cool. And uh, Drew's wondering, any feel for how many of the aircraft are using your leaning technique? Can you see it in the data? Well, we certainly can tell whether people are running Richard Peak or Lena Peak. Um, I don't exactly know what my leaning <laughs> technique is, but um, but he must have watched your other webinars I mean, that you've done. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can we can certainly tell if they're running Richard Peak and Lena Peak. If they're running Lena Peak, we can tell if they're doing a fast. Big mixture pull or a, or a slow agonizing one. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we can tell by looking at the data, of course. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, do you have any Pilatus PC12 in your cohort? Other than no. the report card, are there any other analysis you provide for for uh, turboprop? Uh, no, that that's actually something that we um, are interested in pursuing. Um, because in particular the the, the Pratts are, are inherently very well instrumented and um, I understand that Pratt and Whitney charges a, an arm and a leg to uh, to to analyze that data uh, it is not something that has risen to the top of our to-do list yet it is something we're interested in doing in the future uh, another thing that we're interested in doing which we haven't yet acted on is um, um, being able to do analysis for for some of the the, the new uh, uh, diesel engine technologies that are coming along, like the like the ones that are flying in some of the Diamond aircraft right now, um, it's not something we're doing yet. But this is there's there's lots of things that we would like to do, and we've got you know sort of finite resources, so we sort of have to work on just a couple of things at a time. And so we're not, no, we're not doing, uh, right now, savvy analysis is strictly limited to piston. Okay. Well, great, Mike. Great. Awesome presentation. We've had a lot of people uh, chime in. They really appreciate it. Good presentation. They earn, learned an awful lot uh, tonight. Please, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. Please uh, take a moment and uh, share your closing thoughts and comments with everybody. Okay. Um, next three First Wednesday of the month webinars coming up. Um, April webinar titled "What Does Airworthy Mean?" Um, it's uh, actually 
that webinar revolves around a lawsuit that I wound up getting sucked into the middle of to, as, as kind of an arbitrator in a dispute between a buyer of, and a seller of an aircraft where the issue at in litigation hung on the meaning of the word airworthy and it got us to doing some very interesting analysis and introspection of exactly what airworthy means in the real world <laughs> as opposed to what it means from a theoretical standpoint so uh, that's that's what the April webinar is about uh, May webinar is entitled buyer walk away it, it's uh, the, the subject here is you um, uh, you're interested in buying an airplane you have a pre-buy done on it and discover that there are some issues with the airplane how do you decide whether those issues are ones that you that can be negotiated or ones that are deal breakers where you walk away from the deal so that that's kind of the, the general thrust of what that uh, the May webinar is going to be about and the June webinar all about field approvals will be talking about um, what kinds of alterations do and do not require field approvals and for those that do what the what what the process is for first of all figuring out whether a field approval is necessary second figure out whether it's even possible and third how you actually work with the FAA to to get one so that's that's what's coming up um, through June and um, um, I haven't even thought about July <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll all be heavily in, in in air venture mode by July. I don't even want to think about it. Um, and as 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 always, uh, uh, if you haven't already done so, I would encourage you to sign up for my uh, monthly e newsletter at savvyaviation.com um, or by checking the checkbox on the post webinar survey that Tim will be putting up shortly. Um, we send out one uh, e-newsletter a month it's all about various maintenance and analysis kinds of things and uh, every one of them has an unsubscribe link so if you decide that you don't want to be on it anymore you just have to click on the link but I think there's a lot of good stuff in there and I think you'll enjoy it and uh, you know finally if you haven't read my little manifesto book yet that, that kind of articulates my whole maintenance philosophy tries to boil it down into a little less than 100 pages it's available uh, on Amazon just Google Mike Bush manifesto and it'll take you right to it and uh, and that's all I have until uh, until next month Tim wonderful thanks a lot Mike and just a plug for your newsletter I really enjoy receiving your newsletter every month. I always get something out of it. So thank you for doing that and, and sending it out to us. Well, thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much for a great presentation, Mike. And to everybody who tuned in tonight, uh, thank you so much for tuning in and hope you can join us next week when Professor Paul Schock will be talking about installing ADSB in his aircraft and all that he went through to do so. Should be an interesting presentation. I'm going to try to I'm going to try to get to that one myself. Awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm still non-compliant, so. <laughs> uh oh, uh -oh. time's running out. The clock is ticking, huh? Yep. All right. Very good. Well, thanks again, everybody. Have a great night. Night, everybody. <laughs>